Last week you were gone, man, so I went a little old school the way that I started this show way, way back two years ago. I did a little monologue, and you know me. I like to get into some of the meatier topics when you're not around because I seem to have this ability to get into topics that stir the pot a little bit. And one of the things I think that does stir the pot whenever you mention it is anything related to race in this country. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that it's something that is polarizing. It's a hot button issue. And I talked a little bit, pontificated is really a better word for it, about the Glenn Kuyper situation. And he's the broadcaster of the Oakland A's. We've certainly got a lot of mileage out of the Oakland A's and how bad they are. So adding on top of this now, we're just this is the third show in a row that we're going to talk about it. But he had a little bit of a misstep on a broadcast. And you're the one who actually brought it to my attention and sent me the TikTok, even though that's trending all over the place. I'm not going to rehash exactly what happened, but let's just say that he said a word on the broadcast that was not great and he has been suspended indefinitely. I talked about it and made my feelings known. I think I even told you via text how I felt about it. But I wanted to give you the runway to talk about it with our listeners because you weren't here to rebut or even give any type of an opinion on the situation. So the floor is yours to talk about that situation. So for me, I think that the context of what he was saying makes it even worse. Because obviously, I mean, we can we can hash it out here real quick that, you know, the before black people were allowed to play baseball in the major leagues, they had their own league, right? And it was commonly referred to as Negro Leagues. Well, he didn't call it that. He called it the very the racial slur that we all are familiar with. And without missing a beat, like it was the most natural thing he's ever said, which was very disturbing. I just don't like I've never, ever, ever, ever heard someone refer to that league that way ever. Not once. Like, it's not like it's an old way that people used to say it. And he just slipped or something like I, I have no clue how he ended up at that point. And I mean, in his co-host that was working with him, I mean, that guy just kept rolling too. And I mean, I think you have to in that situation. I don't know what he could have done uh, that would have made things any better at that point in time, but it was so egregious and just, I, I it, it caught me off guard. When I first saw it, I thought it was one of the, I thought it was fake. Honestly, that's how ridiculous it was. I thought it had to be fake. And to realize it was absolutely real was just shocking. It, there were so many things about it that just stood out to me. First of all, his color guy was Dallas Braden, who I believe threw a perfect game for the A's and is kind of a crazy person. And I also noticed that he didn't react. And I thought, how would I react, right? Like We generally tend to condemn a lot of people for something that they do or don't do. But I think it's important that you put yourself in their shoes and what would you have done? I can't tell you that I, there's no way that I wouldn't have reacted. Like I would have done one of those side look things like, well, what? I, I don't think I would have been able to hold it in no matter what I had been taught. And who knows, maybe Dallas Braden has been taught to not react to something like that because you do kind of want to let it go. But it was the whole thing of how about how he used the hard R, first of all. Like he didn't even, it wasn't casual or or anything like that. And he's like pointing in front of the camera talking about the things that they did. And it's it slipped so casually. And it slipped in a casual way that I immediately thought, oh, he's used that word before. And I don't know that for sure. It's all conjecture, of course. He's not going to come out and say that he has. Nobody would. But at the same time, that word is just something that I try to stay away from. Even last week, talking about it, I stayed away from saying the Negro League because that word makes me uncomfortable. I understand that's what the league is called. Sure. But it still makes me uncomfortable. And it's like, man there's just so much of a slippery slope in even trying to use those words and also the negative connotation that any of those words has, right? Like people will say the Negro League, but also forgetting what it meant. It meant that they weren't allowed to play with white players. That part of it is actually the part that's important. And that part of history has finally only started to become assimilated into the collective history of Major League Baseball. But for a long time, it was separate. And so that you're right. All the context around it, what he was talking about, it all matters to me. And I don't think he did it maliciously. Like, I don't think that he was like, all right, I'm going to say this and we're just going to roll with it. I think he probably was horrified that he said it. My main concern was how else has he used this word and where else has he used it? Because there's no way that that was the first time in his life that he said it and just it slipped. No, and he was talking about it so almost passionately as far as the experience that they had. Which, you know, which makes it obvious that he didn't think he was he, he had no clue or did not believe for a minute that he was saying anything wrong. 
And so I honestly wonder for a minute if he, if this man is so unfamiliar that he really believes that's what it was called. I'd be curious, not that that justifies it, but I'd wonder if he was so detached from the world that he thought that's what the league was called. And two, even if that's what it was called, man, like you got to know, you can't say that. Like you cannot say that ever. The, the, the term that he used is like the term that somebody would use to talk about that, like in the deep South somewhere, like in those pockets of the deep South where racism is alive and well, the KKK is probably alive and well. And they would use what he said to describe some football team, high school football team. You know what I'm talking about? Like that's how it sounded to me. And the whole thing was just uncomfortable. And they obviously suspended him. My guess is that because the A's are going out of town, he's probably going to lose his job. And does it really matter? I mean, yeah, I know he's been calling the games for 20 years, but they are trying to separate themselves from everything Oakland A's at this point. They're trying to move on. So they can go get, maybe Brent Musburger will call their games. I think he's calling Raiders games. So why not bring him in? Because, you know, he's not uncomfortable at all. But I think they're just going to move on from it. And, you know, yeah, you know, so that part of it is interesting. But the other thing I wanted to get your opinion about, because I feel a little bit more strongly about this, because, again, I think that, the Glenn Kuyper situation is so, it's crazy because of how he used it and everything you talked about, but I don't think it was malicious. And then there's Bob Huggins, who I know that you generally like guys like this and guys that don't give a crap about the establishment and stuff like that. And when it comes to sports figures, that's fine. But he was on this radio show. I think you probably heard the clip. We're not going to repeat it here. But man, he had a very casual conversation with those guys on that radio station and felt real comfortable saying some things that, you just cannot say in 2023, especially if you are the head basketball coach at a major university. And I think that was a little bit different. That felt a little bit more, I don't want again want to say intentional, but man, it sounds like they, the three of them have had that conversation before. So I was a lot more harsh on Bob Huggins, but I wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah, Bob Huggins knew exactly what he was saying and was perfectly comfortable saying it, which is disturbing in and of itself. Um, there's one thing to not, to, to kind of be anti-establishment and, and march to the beat of your own drum. And then there's another to just be downright offensive, uh, sexist, racist, homophobic, ist, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's what he was, man. And the fact that he's still employed uh, by a, a state institution is absolutely fascinating. Now, we could debate if the state he works in has anything to do with his um, continued employment. No, I mean, he... You could tell that that's you. You worried, you know. You asked the question about uh, Glenn Kuyper. You know, it, it sounded like a word that he said regularly. That he said before, like this sounds like a phrase that Bob Huggins has uttered numerous times um, in mixed company, and obviously doesn't care. Um, now, the question I have is: Was this a leaked conversation, or was this like on the radio? Uh, on it's, a, it's live, yeah, oh, yeah, live. So, I mean, that's again. I guess he just doesn't give a shit. And, and and I'll say this, whether it's, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's right at all, but I've always been the type of person that you want to be about it, be about it, just own it. Don't like, you know, hey, if that's what, if that's how you feel, whatever, now you have to accept the consequences, you know, don't come out and apologize though. Like if, if you're about it and you said it and that's what you believe, don't come out and apologize, just be about it. I, I have, I may not respect you as a person but i have respect for you i have respect for the fact that you stand by whatever it is that you believe in like that you're you're 100 percent all in on whatever it is um i i get that um but absolutely unacceptable from a, a head basketball coach at a major university like you said especially a state institution oh it's insane and they said that punishment was enough because they re-signed him he was going to retire i think and they're bringing him back and they're docking him a million dollars pay. And I'm like, so what? He's still making three and a half million dollars. Like, what is that telling everybody? And the weird part is he hasn't ever won a national title. So it tells you everything you need to know about West Virginia basketball in the fact that just because they make the tournament and win a lot, that's good enough for them. Winning a national title doesn't matter to them. And Bob Huggins gets the skirt by. And I guess my larger concern is like, what does this tell you about what these institutions really care about? And it seems like winning matters more than anything. And I, I guess I can't fault them for that because that is the way it's set up. That's the paradigm we have. But man, like when that happens so easily on, on radio 
And then it's so easy that they're like, yeah, we're bringing them back. We're just going to dock and pay. It's like, okay, so morals don't matter for shit. Like nobody cares about this stuff. And I feel like we're just constantly oh, in this place where we can't actually figure out what is good and bad anymore. Like to me, saying what he said so casually in 2023 on a live mic, on a live radio station should be like one strike and you're out. Like that's a no go. Zero tolerance policy for this stuff. And yet apparently it isn't. But if you and I were to do that in our workplace, we'd be fired. Oh, absolutely. And you look, I feel like we've seen this, right, just a few times this year in NCAA athletics. Look at Alabama basketball, right? Um, and there's some other examples, right? Texas, their basketball coach, uh, Chris Beard or whatever. I mean, there have been numerous incidents where, now granted he was fired, right? But there have been numerous incidents where coaches are retained in situations I remember mentioning it maybe in regards to the Alabama situation. You wonder if you know, college sports are so unique that I think people are way more passionate about their college team than they are about their pro team. And that's because at the, the higher levels of the booster world, you know, they have, you know, because of the money they donate, they have access. Maybe they have influence. And that doesn't exist in the professional world. So I think if you feel like you have this coach in the palm of your hand because of your donations, and you have access and influence that you're going to do whatever you can in your power or within your control to keep that person in the role that they're in because it's it benefits you in some way. And I wonder if that has something to do with it in these different situations, which is shocking. And then the, their willingness, and I'm sure we'll get to this, their willingness to retain coaches is shocking, especially when you compare it to the NBA, who is going to fire coaches. There are three coaches that made the playoffs and got fired fired lost their jobs four was it I think four? It's four yes yeah um, i think it's four i mean that's absolutely ridiculous and, and we can talk more about that here shortly but it, you know there's a total contrast between worlds right here's what i want to talk about with the nba that's a good segue because you famously on this show talked about how they were the most meaningless head coaches in all of professional sports and the fact that they get fired so easily and yet all these guys seem to rinse and repeat, get you know rehashed in all these different places, kind of lends to your theory. But the one I want to start with is the Bucks coach. Now, the last time we recorded together, we talked about Giannis. We played the clip here after they had lost in the first round, and Mike Budenholzer got fired. What we found out last week while you were gone is apparently his brother had passed away during that series, and he continued to coach through it. And I don't think that that's necessarily reason for him not to get fired because I think he gets fired for the fact that he has Giannis and they've only won one title, which in my mind sounds ridiculous. They only won one title when so many it is these ridiculous. franchises. It is, but it's the way that it is now. It's like if you don't win multiple titles with a generational talent, you're done. And so he's gone. But I wanted to ask you about the idea of we've always sort of revered the athlete and or the coach for coaching or playing through these types of adversities. I think the most famous story is probably Brett Favre on Monday Night Football after his dad passed away. And now we'll look at where Brett Favre is now. But my point is, is Mike Budenholzer, there's no way that he's probably 100% coaching with something like that without knowing what his relationship was with his brother and everything. But you hear a lot of these stories. I think Cavaliers coach Tyron Liu talked about how he's lost seven family members since December and he went to zero of the funerals because the Cavs were in a losing streak and he knew that he had to do that. And do you think that that's an archaic way of looking at this? And I'm, again, I'm not saying that Mike Budenholzer shouldn't have been fired, but man, I feel like when they talk about family in pro sports, family actually doesn't matter. It's winning above all and that's it. Oh man, like uh, there's actually a situation that's that's similar to this in the same vein. I, I won't share it on the show. I'll share it with you off air um, just because it, it it's a little personal. Not Well, I was involved in it, but from a point of telling someone they were an asshole for refusing to miss uh, coaching a game to be with their family. But I think it's absurd. In this day and age, like you have assistant coaches. Like if you can't miss a game to go be at a funeral or be with your family, you know, shame on ownership shame on the front office if they don't allow that type of thing i don't care how much money you're getting paid you're still a human being um, who has a family that they love and care about and that family loves and cares about them you should be there you should be allowed to be there now if you just simply choose not to be there that's on you i guess uh and your conscience and you'll have to handle that someday but if if it's the organization that's saying hey the expectation is that you're here no matter what that's sort of absurd i think 
And uh, and really, I mean, you know, the some of the people that would be complaining about it the most are the fans, which I think is preposterous. You know, they they think that just because they are making making millions of dollars and coaching a team they're a fan of that that they owe them to be there all the time or something. And uh, I guess what fan, if your brother dies, you're probably going to miss the game to be at the funeral. And if you don't, you're a psychopath. So, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of where I stand on it. It's, I guess it, we have evolved sensibilities in a lot of ways. And you could make an argument that our evolved sensibilities have sort of pinned us into a corner in some places because we've become very hypersensitive about certain things. And we don't really know, you and I at least, where like the morality line is on certain things. But it doesn't mean that we don't understand humanity. And that humanity part, which we try and make a part of this show, we try and do that every single week to humanize ourselves because the people that watch this and listen to this who don't know us from any other person, they don't know that we don't do this for a living. They don't know that we you know, have regular lives. And I think it's important to do that. But for these professionals, it's so difficult to do that where Mike Budenholzer loses his brother and still coaches through it because in that locker room, that is a sign that, you know, it would be a sign of weakness if he didn't show up. But yet, how could you expect him to be at full capacity doing this? And when you look back at some of the things that happened at the end of that series, when they lost to the Heat, all the timeouts that he didn't call, all the adjustments that he didn't make, how do we know that his mind wasn't in a fog? And how do we know that he's not thinking about those things? As somebody who's lost a parent, it does mess with you. And it doesn't necessarily mess with you every single day. But I know that in the week after that, I was a mess. And I cannot even imagine going to an NBA sideline and trying to win an NBA title. And I, again, I don't think he necessarily didn't deserve to be fired because of it. But there's countless stories where people have not been given that grace to be human. And I talked about that podcast who talked about the hockey player who missed the game because his wife was having their first child and he dogged the guy. Like, are you kidding? Like, then it's not just players, it's coaches. And even in our workplace, man, I don't know if you've, you've had this happen to you, but after my mom died, you know, I took a couple of days. And when I came back, they're like, hey, I hope you're good. Here's your stack of stuff that you had. And everything rolls on. Your life rolls on. And it's a sobering thought that I don't know where our humanity actually counts for anything. It is really sad. Uh, I'll say this much. The place I work for now, um, they would let you take as much time as you needed um, and pay you for it. I can tell you that. The company I worked for prior to where I'm at now, uh, that probably wouldn't have been the case. The expectation would have been similar to what you dealt with. You'll fulfill your obligation basically as a family member to this person and then get back here and do your job. And and I'm sorry, but this day and age, like, you know, I, hey, I'm all about grit and toughness and all, and all that shit. We, we joke about it here, but uh, mental health is a real thing. And like, you got to have time to work through some of that stuff and work through the emotions that come along with it. And I think some companies are coming around and realizing uh, that humanity is important and that caring about the people you work for as, as human beings and as people in general is, is important because if you do that, that person's going to show up for you when it matters, you know? And, and I think, you know, if, if you invest in a person on a humanitarian level and you care about them genuinely, like they're going to care about the little things that matter to you as far as like from a business perspective. Um, unfortunately, uh, too many companies are driven by uh, the bottom line and the almighty dollar. And yeah, I get you got to make money to stay in business, but uh, great businesses are built by great people. And uh, I think that gets forgotten about sometimes.